who Dr. Richmond really through the fellowship of this Congress. But we have a connection that uh, he's not even aware of. I didn't tell him. I haven't mentioned this. I was saving it, Dr. Richmond, uh, for this occasion. You know, I am the son of a surgeon. My father was the first black resident to train at George Washington Hospital in Washington, D.C. And the second year residents in the late 50s, when he was a second year resident, they spent one year, the entire PG2 year, uh, working at the VA hospital in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Um, so my father uh, and mother went to West, uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia with my two older sisters, one age 16 months and one 21 months. And a year later, they came back pregnant with me. And so although I wasn't born in West Virginia, Dr. Richmond is a West Virginia brother from another mother. <laughs> and so this handsome young man was in fact born in Berkeley, West Virginia, uh, born and raised, educated, and went to Marshall University where he got his undergraduate degree in organic chem chemistry, um, went to West Virginia University where he got both his MD degree and his business degree, uh, and where he then uh, pursued his surgical training in the Charleston division of that same university. Now, during that time, he met a nurse uh, who would become the love of his life, Linda, and uh, their 25-year marriage, uh, their 25-year union has produced both Haley, 21 years old, and Jackson, 14 years old. That next quarter century, which culminates with this honor today, has been a period of enormous personal success, family growth, clinical and academic success, uh, administrative success, and service to his native West Virginia in our craft of surgery, as well as the uh, the, the national uh, su uh, surgical organizations. This is their beautiful growing family. It's obviously this is a family that loves the outdoors. He's a wrestler by his youth youthful days, but a kayaker and outdoorsman uh, and participates uh, with uh, his children and their many activities. Now, although he is a wrestler, uh, uh, young Jackson has benefited from gaining a little more height and he's become a basketball player. And I, I envy Dr. Richmond because he's embarking on a great period where you get to watch your kids play high school sports and so forth. And it's just great times that you're looking for. And I, I know you're proud of them and they're proud of you. Now, during this uh, 25 year period of academic growth, he rejoined his alma mater, joined the faculty in 2005 rose through the academic, clinical, and administrative ranks uh, to the position of professor and division chief. Uh, he, in 2017, was named uh, the Walt William Mayer uh, Endowed Professor of Research, and in 2020, the Burt Bradford Professor and cha Chair of the Department of Surgery. Uh, throughout that time, he served his state as the at-large member to the American College Surgeons Board of Governors from the state of West Virginia, served as the, on the executive committee of the American College of Surgeons Board of Governors as the head of the communications pillar uh, and president of the West Virginia chapter of the American College of Surgeons. He's also served the Southern Surgical as a second vice president, uh, the American Board of Surgery as a council member, and of course, our own organization uh, as the treasurer and now our president. But beyond all of that, if you were to ask, and, and I give great thanks to Linda for sharing these beautiful photos, but if you were to ask his family uh, what endears them most to him, it's him figuring out as he climbs the barriers and scales the vicissitudes of academic surgery, figuring out the time to spend time with his kids. How many people do you know have professional success by the time their kids are teenagers, they're telling them to go to hell. But uh, Dr. Richmond, it's clear from uh, the many photos that we've seen and uh, that he's proud of his family. They're proud of him. Haley seems to want to follow his mom, her mom's footsteps into nursing. Jackson, perhaps following dad into medicine. Uh, time will tell. Uh, but this beautiful family has a lot to be proud of. And so do we as we uh, pay homage and hear about unique places in our own house of surgery from our president, Dr. Brian Richmond.
So full disclosure, I am nervous. So I'd like to thank President-elect Cornwell for that nice introduction. It was a lot tamer than I was warned that it was gonna be. I'd also like to thank all of you for your attendance today. And for those of you that know me well, you have to know how thrilled I am to stand before you in this role and to have the opportunity to deliver this address. As some of you may recall, we used to have a, a printed program book and the printed program book would always have a picture of the president's home institution on the cover. And that's no longer the case since we've gone to the app. So I wanted to include a picture of my home institution. This is the West Virginia University Charleston Division located at Charleston Area Medical Center and the home of the CAMC Institute for Academic Medicine. And I would like to thank them for their support and start by recognizing the individuals from Charleston who were able to attend and support me today. Would any current or former residents and faculty from the Charleston Division uh, or any medical students in attendance, please stand and be recognized at this time. That I, I wanna thank all of you and it means a lot to me that you, that you came, presented your best work and came to support your president. I would also, uh, of course, like to recognize my wife, Linda, who is in attendance and has been a source of support and inspiration for me for the last 27 years of my life. If you could please stand. So if you come from West Virginia, you have to get ahead of the jokes. Okay, so let me just, first of all, just address the elephant in the room. She looks a lot younger than I am, okay? In fact, we're only five years apart. She's just aged a lot more gracefully. So no, I did not marry her when she was 13 and she is not my cousin. So, so before I actually get into the substance of my address, I'd like to offer a few acknowledgements to some key individuals who have helped me along the way with their friendship, sponsorship, and mentorship. Nobody can talk about the Southeastern Surgical Conference without referencing the name of Dr. J. David Richardson. Dr. Richardson served as a mentor to many in this room and was perhaps the most recognizable surgical leader in the US. His sudden passing a little over two years ago hit all of us in this organization very hard. And I think of him often. Despite being as busy as he always was, he always had the time to answer the phone and provide counsel and advice I'm proud to have known him, and once again, I, I miss him very, very much. The man everybody knows, Dr. Rick Green. Rick appointed me to the executive committee of the Southeastern during his presidential year. This was the first time I had served on the leadership council of a major organization. And since then, we've become great friends and check in frequently by phone. He continues to always be available to offer advice, counsel, and friendship. And in addition, he has acquainted me with a wonderful liqueur called Sambuca, which we always consume together when we have the opportunity to visit. And that's frequently. Rick, you're a gentleman and a scholar, and I value your friendship and your mentorship greatly. Dr. David Feliciano, during his presidential year, took the action of changing the position of chair of finance to the office of treasurer. This was the first time that I had held a major office in a national organization. David made me feel that my contributions in the management of the finances of the Southeastern were valuable and to have this validation from such a thought leader in American surgery and from one who I respected so greatly was quite an experience. Since that time, David has continued to offer his mentorship, his support and his advice. I told the, uh, the council yesterday in our meeting that I'd like to think that I have run our meetings this year like David used to run his, fast and efficient. But to be honest, I don't know if anybody can be as fast as David is at running a meeting. And even if I still, excuse me, even if I was, I still wouldn't be as cool as David because I never ran a meeting while I was speeding down the highway in my Corvette on my cell phone. And he has. Uh, even today, he offered me advice when I told him I was a little nervous about giving my address. He said, just do what I do. When you're giving a talk, just realize that no one knows more about the topic in the room than you. Seriously though, David is one of the nicest people you'll meet in American surgery, although I'm quite sure that he will deny that if you ask him. Tim Farrell and I have become close friends over the last decade. I speak to Tim frequently and we have collaborated on many projects within the Southeastern, including publications, 
designing the Southeastern Surgical Feud, and just generally brainstorming about the organization and whatever else comes to mind. Tim has done a yeoman's job as our executive director, and I will miss our collaborations as we both rotate off the leadership and get put out to pasture. Tim, you're a true gentleman, and I want you to know how much our friendship means to me. And finally, the man that needs no introduction in the Southeastern, Dr. Ken Sharp. Many surgeons will leave behind some type of legacy. This may be an operation that they were famous for performing or a textbook or a procedure that was named after them. But in Ken's case, his legacy will be that of mentorship. Ken has supported me and countless other surgeons along their journey in dozens of ways. He's assigned me sessions to moderate at the Clinical Congress. He's written countless letters of support on my behalf. He strategized with me about how to advance in American surgery. And he's always been available as a friend and a confidant. Ken, I want you to know that I may never be able to pay you back, but I will certainly pay what you have done for me forward to the next generation should I be fortunate enough to have that opportunity. And finally, there are a number of people that I've worked with, perhaps not as closely as the ones I just mentioned, but have allowed me to learn from them and benefit from their friendship. These include Dr. Phil Burns, Dr. Grace Rosicki, Dr. Alex Rosemurgy, Dr. Don Nakayama, Dr. Kevin Behrens, Dr. David Adams, my work wife, Dr. Rebecca Britt, Dr. John Sweeney, Dr. Bill Richards, Dr. Richard Field, Dr. Joe Sharma, Dr. Alan Marr, Dr. Eddie Cornwell, Dr. Manny Zervos, Dr. Amy Hildreth, who I've had the opportunity to get to know better this year working on the board, and finally this year's program chair, Dr. John Stewart. I thank all of you for what you have allowed me to learn from you. I've enjoyed our collaborations greatly, and I look forward to many more in the future. And finally, I have to pay homage to and give sincere thanks to Jill Margie and all the folks at LP. Your professionalism, organization, and accessibility have made my job over the past few years a breeze. And we, the organization, thank you and appreciate you more than you know. And now on to the actual address. I have no disclosures. So when discussing the surgical community in a very broad sense, it's not unusual to hear the term, the house of surgery. I've always had my own ideas about what this phrase might refer to and its implications, but I had never seen a description of what the phrase really means and what it actually refers to. I felt that knowing this was essential so that I could be sure that I didn't misrepresent the definition of the term and its context in this address. But I quickly found out that the origin of the phrase is not well known to most people. I contacted officials from the American College of Surgeons, as well as surgical historians, and surgeons whom I knew had a long history with the college and other major surgical organizations. No one was able to tell me where it came from or where it was first used, although there was a general feeling that it was used to refer to the surgical community as a whole, and it applied that, as we were all within one house, that there was indeed a sense of togetherness enjoyed by surgeons that perhaps was not present in other specialties. Well, after a rather extensive amount of digging, I was able to uncover the origin of the term. The term the house of surgery was first referenced in 1975 by Dr. J.S. Millis in an address that he delivered at ACS headquarters where a two and a half day long national conference on continuing education in surgery was being held. Dr. Millis was in fact not a surgeon but was rather a PhD who was the author of the Millis Report of the Citizens Commission on Graduate Medical Education. This address was then published in a 1975 edition of the ACS Bulletin which you see here. In his address, Dr. Millis made several complimentary statements regarding the contributions that surgeons and surgical organizations such as the ACS and the ABS had made in furthering GME, standardizing credentialing and promoting safety through promoting and development, developing a legitimate peer review process. He expressed his opinion that the surgical organization had distinguished themselves and led the way in being exceptionally in tune with the needs of the profession and how to take the profession to the next level. He also gave credit to these surgical organizations for setting a very high bar for other organizations to follow. Interestingly, the full title of the presentation was The House of Surgery, the Independence and the Interdependence of the Surgical Specialties. This title actually has a biblical origin. Dr. Millis drew the phrase from the Gospel of St. John in which it was written that Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. A little further on, there are the words, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to abide in the vine, then no more 
can ye? Now, I'm in no way a biblical scholar, but to me, it seems like what Jesus was referring to was the fact that the grape cannot exist without the leaf, which cannot exist without the vine, which cannot exist without the branch, which cannot exist without the tree. So in the simplest interpretation, we as surgeons are both independent in our practices and practice settings, but yet we are interdependent on each other in, our, in order to achieve our goal of providing accessible and high quality surgical care to our patients and the world as a whole. In other words, we all need each other for this goal to be recognized. In the house are many mansions, and we may occupy different mansions or rooms within this great house, but ultimately the function of the house as a whole is what is really important. The house must remain communal and collegial and is ultimately reliant on a sense of surgical community for its success. So once again, since 1975, there have been many references to the house. But how cohesive is the surgical community? Do we function like a family living under one roof? Do we share the rooms of the house with mutual respect and understanding of all its inhabitants? And considering these questions, I was forced to think about all the different rooms or mansions as described in the passage I read earlier within the house of surgery and who resides within them. Let's consider a few examples. We have trainees, such as medical students, residents, and fellows. We have surgeons practicing in rural environments. We have surgeons practicing surgery in the community, both as broad-based general surgeons and surgical subspecialists. We have surgeons who practice in an academic setting and in numerous surgical subspecialties. We have surgeon scientists who not only perform surgery, but also devote a portion of their time to basic science and translational research that hopefully then will be used to advance our profession further. And also, it's important to point out that the surgical workforce is more diverse than ever, and that every mansion or room within the house should reflect this. So then what are some threats to this much needed harmony within the house? There are many, and I think we as a group must make it a priority to avoid these threats. One of course is the tendency that we have for us to work in our individual silos rather than in a unified and collaborative fashion. This silo mentality places individuals into defined groups rather than fostering collaboration among the groups. Also in a silo mentality, the focus tends to be on the differences between the groups rather than the things that are shared between the groups. And this strategy may ultimately serve to marginalize important voices and create discontent among members of the surgical community that feel their voice is not being heard or that their contribution is maybe not as important as others. And there are a few concrete examples that I can provide that may provide some context. So for example, there was a time when women in surgery were not well represented. And although we can always improve, this is nowhere near the problem that it used to be. Women in surgery today are well represented in the surgical workforce and in surgical leadership, and also comprise a significant proportion, nearly 50% of surgical trainees, which will provide a pipeline for ongoing growth and even better representation in the years to come. The Society of Black Acad Academic Surgeons has made great strides in advancing the position of African Americans and other people of color in American surgery, and newer organizations such as the Society of Asian Academic Surgeons and the Association of Out Surgeons and Allies are making similar moves to advance other represented groups as well. Another example is rural surgery. There was a time when rural surgeons felt unseen and by their own description, frankly, neglected by the college and other major surgical organizations. Today, however, because of the work of surgeons like Tyler Hughes, Mike Serap, Richard Field III, and others directed towards increasing the awareness of importance of rural surgery, rural surgery now has a robust representation within the college and consequently within the house of surgery. Another consequence of the silo mentality is that of the imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, so-called perceived fraudulence, is a syndrome in which an individual experiences feelings of self-doubt and personal incompetence that persist regardless of the individual's education, experience, and accomplishments. This phenomenon, which is actually quite common among surgeons, may be accompanied by feelings of isolation, anxiety, and even depression. And I've had discussions with fellow surgeons, some of whom are some of the most accomplished individuals that I personally know, who despite that, acknowledge these feelings, and I myself have struggled with this through the years. The high prevalence of this phenomenon perhaps suggests that our environment as it currently exists may not be as supportive as it could and should be to members of the house. 
To defeat imposter syndrome, you can employ a host of psychological strategies, but the fundamental underlying and unifying concept of these lies in the recognition that this is not a rare phenomenon. And once again, in finding community and acceptance among your colleagues, you have you clearly have an example of where the concept of the house of surgery has real significance and real impact. But are we a house divided? In other words, can the different factions within the house peacefully coexist? I believe that they most certainly can and should, but to achieve this, it will require They occupy the lowest position on the totem pole, which in surgery can not be the easiest place to be. And as a result, they may feel a lack of belonging to the surgical community and may therefore become discouraged in pursuing or finishing their surgical training. This is where there is opportunity within the house. As fellow residents of the house, we should welcome these trainees into our organizations in appreciation of the noble and challenging path that they have chosen. We've all been there. We must show them the best of who we are and what we do, both personally and professionally. We need to inspire them and we need to embrace them. And in doing so, we'll succeed in recruiting the best, training the best, and in doing so, maintaining the vigor and viability of our profession in perpetuity. Let's consider the rural surgeons. As I mentioned previously, it's only been over the last 10 to 15 years that significant inroads have been made by rural surgeons to achieve recognition of their importance within the surgical community. This authoritative review article co-authored by past president Don Nakayama and Dr. Tyler Hughes and published in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons described many of the challenges facing rural surgeons in the United States. I encourage all of you to read this to gain a better appreciation of these challenges that these talented surgeons face and the impact that they have on our national healthcare system despite often working in very difficult conditions and dealing with significant resource limitations. Some of these challenges include a difficult practice environment characterized by heavy call burden, very little backup for time off or for help on difficult cases, overall workforce shortage, and a very high volume practice. And although Tyler and others have created more community among rural surgeons, many still lack a sense of belonging and experience professional isolation and a perceived lack of validation as surgical experts by their peers and other practice settings. And here too lies another opportunity to strengthen the house. We need to embrace our rural surgical colleagues. To do this, we need to acknowledge the great value of their work and acknowledge the tremendous dedication and breadth of skills required to succeed in this difficult environment. We need to provide safety net support in a collegial, respectful and efficient manner and perhaps most of all, we need to provide community through a spirit of respect and inclusivity that minimizes the threat of professional isolation that so many rural surgeons feel. Next, let's consider the practicing community surgeon. These may be either broad-based general surgeons or surgical subspecialists, and they may either be hospital employed or working in a traditional private practice model. But like rural surgeons, these surgeons also face challenges. Many of these surgeons have very high volume practices with significant pr pressure to produce high clinical volumes. Hospital employed surgeons often find themselves pressed to produce more and more work RVUs to maintain the same level of compensation while their counterparts in private practice face rising costs, decreasing reimbursement and increasing regulation. This has actually been well studied. Surgeons practicing in the community consistently report lower job satisfaction, more call, less time off, and more overall job-related stress than their peers in academia. They are also more likely to be involved in a med mouse suit than their academic counterparts. Community surgeons may lack a feeling of community with their surgical peers in their region, since their practice settings are often intensely competitive for referrals and patient volume. And further compounding the struggle of the community surgeon is the competition with well-resourced nearby academic centers for patients, which frequently leads to what's known as the town versus gown conflict. 
So here too lies another opportunity to strengthen the house. Like our colleagues in rural environments, community surgeons should be welcomed into surgical organizations and given opportunities to grow and develop there. Their skills and their contributions to patient care should be acknowledged and they should be well supported by nearby academic institutions when needed. The case for the regionalization of complex surgical problems such as pancreatic resection and esophagectomy has been well proven, but the idea that common surgical problems such as breast care, colectomy, inguinal hernia repair and cholecystectomy could ever be completely regionalized is simply unrealistic. Community surgeons will always play a vital role in providing essential surgical care services, and the house must recognize this by acknowledging how much they meet this tremendous need. While traditional academic surgeons are strongly represented in surgical leadership positions and typically benefit from access to an abundance of institutional resources, their path is not without struggles as well. Many academic surgeons are encouraged to develop a very focused practice, sometimes on a single disease process, which may lead their non-academic colleagues to view their skill set as less diversified. In addition, these surgeons face significant pressure to produce academically through publishing, obtaining external funding, and striving for promotion from within their institution, often while still being expected to be productive clinically. Although it is not uncommon for academic surgeons to pursue surgical leadership positions outside their institution, there's substantial variation as to how much these leadership positions are supported by the departmental and institutional leadership. For example, one member of this organization told me that within his department, people were discouraged from seeking positions on the American Board of Surgery because of the time away from clinical practice. So uh, that's a, somewhat of an academic conflict of interest that they have to deal with. Departmental culture may vary greatly from institution to institution. This may greatly affect the work environment and job satisfaction. And even within the academic surgical community itself, there's sometimes competition as to how academic one institution is relative to another. Finally, academic surgeons are frequently compensated at levels lower than their community surgical counterparts. So here too lies an opportunity for us to strengthen the house. Ac academic surgeons should be recognized and respected by their peers in the community for their scientific contributions and the support that they provide on tertiary care cases. Doing this will require that surgeons at non-academic centers acknowledge that Defined expertise, sometimes in a very narrow area, will frequently lead to improved outcomes in the treatment of complex problems. Acknowledging this reflects an understanding of and mutual respect for our academic colleagues. And finally, we should all acknowledge the tremendous role that academic surgeons play in teaching and training the next generation of surgeons, and in doing so, maintaining the viability of our beloved profession. The surgeon scientists, those surgeons who divide their time between clinical care and scientific research also face struggles. These surgeons typically have part-time clinical commitments, which vary according to their individual circumstances, as well as a significant commitment to overseeing a surgical basic science laboratory. They typically go through an extended period of training to become proficient in laboratory science, which often leads to a much later start in their surgical careers. A recent survey indicated that only 32% of surgeon scientists felt that it was realistic for surgeons to be successful in basic science research in today's environment. And even when chairs were included in this survey, the number only rose to 35%. Surgeon scientists are finding it increasingly difficult to obtain extramural funding and often face excessive clinical demands that are out of balance with their expected clinical commitment, or rather, excuse me, their expected scientific commitment. Others report being provided an insufficient amount of protected time and excessive administrative duties and in addition, depending on the nature of their specific practice composition, it is not uncommon for non-scientist colleagues in both the community and academic settings to cast doubt on the quality of their surgery skills. Here too lies an opportunity to strengthen the house. As the authors state in this editorial, the leadership in American surgery must embrace the importance of training and developing surgeon scientists. Departmental colleagues need to work together to provide the necessary support and protected time and the contributions of these individuals should be respected and acknowledged by all surgeons in the profession. Let's touch on the subject of diversity. Diversity is a frequently discussed topic in today's world, but the proper context is important. Most people are aware of the social justice aspect as it pertains to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is indeed important, and we should certainly strive 
to address inequalities and inequities when we identify them, particularly those that affect underrepresented minorities in surgery, as well as other marginalized groups. I think all of us can acknowledge and hope that most institutions are making meaningful movement to address these disparities. But interestingly, and what is not known as well to many, is that team science has demonstrated that diversity results in higher performing healthcare teams. Some have suggested that this is because patients may appreciate being cared for and respond more favorably when members of the healthcare team look like them. Others have suggested that the benefit is found in the diversity of the ideas and lived experiences that a more diverse team brings to the table. So by addressing issues relating to diversity, we're not only addressing disparities and promoting equity, but we're also doing a better job as surgeons in caring for our patients. Therefore, diversity should be a priority in all rooms of the house and in the house as a whole. So in effect, we're taking care of patients and we're taking care of each other. So what are the common themes that we've explored today? Well, first of all, I think we could say that regardless of where you reside in the house, all residents of the house face significant challenges. It's tough being a surgeon. I think it's also fair to say that we all play a vital role in the existence and viability of the house, regardless of how or where we practice. It would follow then that continued success of the house is dependent upon expression of mutual appreciation, support, and respect for all members of our surgical community and the contributions that they make within the house of surgery. We need to strive to understand each other better because we are all far more similar than we are different. Simply put, we all need each other to make American surgery work and united we stand and divided we fall. And this is very much the essence of the term, the house of surgery. And to quote my mentor, Ken Sharp, we all need to bloom where we are planted. If we all maximize our opportunities and our contributions in our various settings, then we will all make the contribution to American surgery that we are all capable of making. And in doing so, our colleagues will acknowledge and appreciate this, and the house will function at maximum efficiency. So as I come to the conclusion of my address, and as my year as your president, I ask you the question, is there an organization that will give a voice to all those in the different rooms of the house? And for many of you in the audience, you already know the answer. And for those of you who don't, I hope that in the next few days, you'll, you'll learn what I've learned over the last 15 years. And that organization is the Southeastern Surgical Congress. Over the years, I've watched this great organization welcome medical students, residents, and junior faculty to the podium for their first presentation. I've seen community surgeons rise within the organization to the highest positions of leadership. I've interacted with and received mentorship, some of the biggest names in American surgery, and I've done so in an environment where this was not just tolerated, but invited and encouraged. Very few organizations possess this dynamic culture, and I consider myself fortunate to be a member. The idea that I would ever hold the office of president is still something that I have a hard time believing. So to all of you from the Southeastern who have provided me the years of friendship, support, sponsorship, and mentorship that helped make this happen, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. We all join surgical organizations for various reasons, recognition, advancement, education, networking, and you may get those things from many different memberships. But there are certain organizations that you grow to truly love, and I can think of no better example than that of the Southeastern because it's a place where all are truly welcome and all are valued. So in closing, I would like to thank the membership and the leadership of the Southeastern for this great opportunity. It has truly been the highlight of my surgical career and one that I will never forget. And finally, in addition to my faculty and attendance, I would like to thank my wife, Linda, and my children, Haley and Jackson, for their sacrifice and support for my career. Without that, this would not be possible. We all know that as we pursue our career goals, we sometimes can maybe let other things go neglected. We all hope not, but, but, but we know when our, when our time is placed in one area, it has to be taken from somewhere else. But your support has meant more to me than all of you will ever know. So I'd like to offer my thanks to all of you, and I hope you all enjoy this wonderful city and the rest of this wonderful meeting. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, President Richmond, for that outstanding talk, for your fellowship and for uh, the spirit of fellowship that uh, characterized your term as president. We uh, have our morning break for about 20 minutes. We will readjourn back here for the Feliciano Rosicki Historical Lecture at 11 o'clock sharp. Thank you. <laughs>